Walking through the cemetery at midnight. On my head, you say you're putting light. But I say the more light you put. Good morning. I know it's tough to compete with the 80 degree weather outside, and there's quite a few people that were, you know, bouncing around last night, so they're uh, sleeping out in the deck right now. I saw quite a few that are taking a bit of a nap. But we've got a wonderful series of enrichment lectures for those that haven't had a chance to meet me. My name is Jimmy Koval. I'm your cruise director or director of entertainment and programming. And um, our lecture that we do have for you as a distinguished author, he is also uh, presented at the United Nations and various institutions around the world. In addition, he is also a merchant marine officer. Please welcome to the stage Captain Richard Heyman. Thank you, Jimmy. Great to be here again. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome aboard this beautiful ship. And, uh, and hello to everybody on deck uh, in the sun. Actually, this, my talks will be on Channel 4. And some things are better taken lying down in bed. But I'm glad to see some of you up and around. Um, I do have a question. How many of you have been around the, the, the sea before? Have you sailed or traveled around? Oh, so correct me if I uh, get the wrong island in my, my d description of it, because uh, this is a special sea. Of course, everyone around the world is a little different than the next. but. Uh, this has been called the Mediterranean of the Americas because it is a piece of water, an extension of the Atlantic that is surrounded by lots of little islands and larger land masses and uh, some very unusual qualities because of the uh, geography of the continents and the islands. And then, of course, it's also a tropical sea, so it's somewhat different than the, the Mediterranean, which, of course, is so contained and has its own uh, special qualities, especially uh, culturally. But I've been coming down to the different islands and around the continental coast for many years, sailing on my own and on, also on ships. And so I've been to almost, uh, oh, I'm trying to count them out. I've been to uh, 30, 40 different islands, but there are actually about 700 altogether that are even large enough to be counted, of which only about 200 of them have inhabitants. So there's lots of little places all through the the sort of spray of islands where we were going through some of them just in the the, uh, the lesser Antilles now. But there's a lot all around the coast and lots of different places. And you too can go pick your own paradise island, name it after yourself, but uh, uh, you may not get away with it with the local authorities for long. But you can find places in the Caribbean that are still fairly natural and undeveloped. Of course, now we are going to some of the more developed parts of it especially we're going to St. Martin on, on our way tomorrow, which is perhaps the most intensely developed of any of the small islands. But then it has beautiful features, and uh, it's a great destination. I first uh, started coming down on my own with a sailing sea kayak. And uh, I have a, um, what's a German Klepper full boat, which has a wood frame and a skin, and, and then a sprit rig and a foresail and lee boards. And, um, those of us who were on the last cruise may remember that my wife was on board, and when we were mere uh, 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 dating, we, I, I badgered her into going sea kayaking with me, and as a sort of a test whether she would really want to stick around with a, a sea dog like me, so we flew this thing down with our gear, and we went sailing through the Bahamas, and then we went to Belize, and sailed down the reef, and up the jungle rivers, and and then that boat has sort of been around the world with me as, as my luggage while working on larger ships. But I, I told a story before. <clears throat> Last year, I was cleaning out a bookshelf, and I found her journal from the first trip with me. And she was saying, I can't believe this guy talked me into going sea kayaking and camping on all these hot, sunny beaches. And she's a fair uh, northerner, so she got terribly sunburned. And then we were chasing fish and trying to grill, and we were getting bitten by sand fleas. And one place in Belize, we were attacked by howler monkeys. And she said, this, this is the last time I ever go with this guy anywhere again. And of course, now that she's been on silver, she's following me anyway, in spite of the rough conditions here. But nonetheless, the, the, sea, the sea is really quite a, a curious place. And I'll show you a few of its curiosities here. Um, I'm sure you know that it is uh, <laughs> this great basin. There are actually two basins between the eastern and the western, um, the Venezuelan basin, then the Colombian basin, and then there's a gap up here where the Caribbean spills into the Gulf of Mexico, which is its own body of water, but it's very much connected in uh, especially currents and climatically. 
But the, the, the edge of the Caribbean, Caribbean, Bar Caribe, however you want to say it, is all of these islands, the Lesser Antilles coming up from where we were, Barbados, Trinidad, off of Venezuela, all the way up to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. The Bahamas are actually out on the Atlantic side, it's called, but Cuba is certainly the biggest of all the islands. And then Florida, Mexico, Central America, they kind of contain this sea, except that it is not contained oceanographically. There's a lot of current that flows through, essentially from the Central Atlantic. There's a sea current and wind coming from the east, coming off of Africa. The equatorial trade winds come in, and they you'll feel it up on deck. There's a constant breeze coming from the east, and that's why uh, these islands were easy to get to. The old in sailing instructions for a tall ship were you sail down from wherever your European port was, you get to the Canary Islands, and from there you'd get the right winds across. And uh, here's a little trivia for the sailors there. They'd be out at sea, and they would know when to turn to the west when the butter melted. And that was the indication it's time to head across the Atlantic. Well, anyway, this, uh, this whole sea is a uh, recent uh, phenomena because as the continent spread out, and the Atlantic, of course, is spreading and getting wider every year, in case you've noticed, uh, every time you cross it, it's about five centimeters a year broader. But what that did is the continents pulled away Africa, South America, North America, and Europe. And then the plates left this Caribbean plate that is another structure of the tectonics. Uh, the Nazca and the Cocos plate are actually moving to the east, whereas the other plates are moving to the west, leaving, leaving a fracture zones all around the Caribbean Sea that created many of the islands about 55 million years ago. Many of them rose because of volcanism, which continues to this day on a limited level. But in the ancient seas, the Tethys Sea was called the pr primeval back, oh, 500 million years ago. Central America wasn't there, and so the Atlantic and the Pacific are actually flowed right through here. Central America rose and created the barrier that is the structure of the ocean and the Caribbean today. These are fracture lines around there. The uh, deepest trench in the area in the, in the Caribbean basin is the Cayman Trench near the island. It's 24,700 feet deep, almost 7,500 meters. And then on the north side, the Puerto Rico t Trench is on the Atlantic side, they call that, but that's the deepest at 26,900 feet or 8,900 meters deep. But most of the, the sea is only about 1,200 feet deep through most, most of the basin, so it's a fairly shallow sea, uh, about 400 meters on average, with a lot of shallows and, of course, these great rises of islands that, that are where we're going. And you can see that there's a continental shelf off of Florida that extend the Bahamas, uh, Yucatan, Nicaragua, Venezuela, those are also the edges of the sea, and the basins are, of course, in between. You can see the trenches that run right from north of Puerto Rico, south of Cuba. Now, here's a new kind of a geological uh, map called a gravity map, which measures the pressure of the crust. And where it is blue, that's actually the least pressure. That's the deepest places. And the Heavier ones are the shallow, where there's more, of course, mass on top of the earth and the pressure plates. But that's used to sense where motion will happen when there are volcanoes and earthquakes, which are common in this area. Now, I will mention the, uh, the extended sea where we're not going, which is the Gulf of Mexico, which is this great basin that is pinched by Florida, Cuba, and Yucatan, Mexico. And that has its own qualities, it's actually warmer than the Caribbean, even though it's a little farther north, because this, the, the, the waters circulate in great loops there, and that's why it's the hottest body of water in the world other than the Red Sea. Now here are just some of the land masses you know. Cuba, Hispaniola, which is Haiti, Dominican Republic, and then the lesser leeward and windward islands, the lesser Antilles. Now Antilles, Antilla, in Spanish, was the name of an island that was known somewhere off to the west and was the goal of uh, Portuguese fishermen and finally Columbus, and people thought that was the stepping stone, of course, to Asia. And so the greater Antilles became the larger islands of Cuba, Hispaniola, including Puerto Rico. The lesser Antilles are all the other islands there. Windward, leeward referred to the difficulty of getting to the 
islands on the eastern Caribbean, especially Barbados, if you're coming from the west, that's upwind and that's windward. And then the lesser and the uh, leeward islands were the ones further north. And that was also a um, administrative term uh, when it was British colonies to, di to distinguish between the regions. But you can imagine on a sail vessel how difficult it might be to get to some of these places or how long it would take. Now here's a bit of the western coast, particularly the Nicaraguan around in Honduras. If you've ever been up there, it's actually very shallow, lots of little coral islands, and then a dense mangrove coast, and it's called the Mosquito Coast, after actually the Mosquito Indians. And you may, there may have been a few films made there, and there's always a trouble in that part of Central America. And then you go into the Bight of Honduras, and then... Guatemala, Belize, and that's where the greatest of the coral reefs are. The, the sea is quite calm over in that area unless there's a hurricane. It doesn't have the, the constant pressure of the currents or the trade winds like you get in the eastern islands. And then Cuba, of course, is the biggest island. It does have on the north side all the great Bahama islands, which are the, oh, about 200 larger islands, lots of little islets and passages around. Now, uh, this ship... Um, came, instead of going outside of the Bahamas, we came in, because of rough seas, we came in what's called the old um, Bahama Channel on the north coast of Cuba and came all the way down to uh, British Virgin Islands through that course along the northern side of Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and then down to um, the Virgin Gorda. And then we're now coming up to St. Martin, which is right there on the north side of Antigua. Now this is... Uh, all of these islands are related geologically, if not uh, so much culturally. They are English, French, Dutch uh, colonies, uh, formerly now many of them independent islands. I'm going to have another day I'm going to talk about just the human history and culture. But I just want to point out that all these islands were volcanic rises, some of which are still have volcanic uh, activity on them. Most famously, Martinique had a great explosion in 1911, wiped out almost all the population. Montserrat is still erupting. We may see that. Then the north coast of uh, South America has various islands, particularly Trinidad, Tobago, and Le Roche, uh, Las Roques, and then the Dutch islands of Curaçao, Aruba, Saba down there. And that is a um, the truly lesser Antilles, because a lot of them are just uh, bare spits of coral that have come up in the sea. Then as you go west down that coast of the Caribbean on Venezuela to uh, Colombia, you have the Great Lake of Maracaibo, and then a mountain range on the coast of Colombia, then the Great Magdalena River coming out of Cartagena, then down to Panama. Now that turns into the thickest rainforest jungle of all in the Americas and the Caribbean Basin. But overlooking this in Colombia is this one great mountain range called uh, Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. And that is the only snow-capped peaks overlooking the Caribbean. Now most people don't imagine you can go skiing on in the morning and go down to the beach in the in the Caribbean, but that's actually a very big mountain range that's not part of the Andes. It's sort of a remnant of of a prior rise of this part of the continent. But it's a biosphere preserve and a reservation for native peoples in that area that were never conquered by either the Incans nor the Spanish, and they are an independent indigenous population of Colombia and they guard their mountain passes and restrict access into this area. But you can go there, it's Santa Marta it's called, and then they have uh, 15 glaciers that are running down into the jungle. So it's very, climatically it's quite dramatic and most people don't even know about it because it was closed off for so long during the recent Civil War troubles of Colombia. But most of the islands we'll see on the on the continental shelves in Bahamas are like this. They're a coral aggregate on top of a shelf often very flat. This is one of the many little keys in Belize. But uh, as um, flat islands, they're easily washed over in storms and washed away, and a lot of them are just sand aggregates that are very unstable. This is a, one of the coasts of, um, on the Gulf of Mexico with great, great sand accumulations on the, on the south coast of the United States. But these islands where we're going, you see the green uh, are volcanoes, and the red are earthquakes in recent measure. And because you know, most of them are actually in Central America. If you've been down the Costa Rican coast, Nicaragua, there's a lot of tremblers and volcanism down through there, not so much down in Panama. 
Um, but the other area is right where we're going. This line of volcanoes that's lifted all these mountains and islands is what we can see the evidence of as we go along. And this is uh, Montserrat, the, the British territory that had to be evacuated in recent years because of the constant eruption of what's called in these islands the Soufriere. That's the French name for just sulfurous. And that's what all of the islands call their volcanoes and, the, of course, the odor that they put off. Uh, here's one that we're going to not be getting too close to, fortunately. It's one island that's coming up out of the sea. It's about, at this point, about 200 meters deep. It's on nautical charts. You have to watch out if this thing erupts. It puts out great bubbles and steam out of the sea. It's called Kickham Jenny, and eventually that'll be a new island as part of the country of uh, uh, Grenada. Here's another island we're going to, though. This is Antigua, which is a well-worn volcanic island that now has all these beautiful scallop bays and many very good harbors. And it's fairly well populated and developed at this point. But this is an example of an eroded volcanic island that uh, has a lot of the scenic features. And then uh, especially sand has built up and coral reefs have been grown around it. So it makes it a very pleasant island. A lot of them on the facing the Atlantic side are being steadily eroded. And they make for dramatic uh, cliffs and rock formations on the West, uh, the eastern shore. So the western shores of all these islands are lured, and that's where the harbors and the residences are mostly. This is uh, part of uh, St. Lucia. Uh, here's a part of Barbados on the eastern shore, which shows how much has been eroded. And uh, this is being measured so that they're actually losing land and landslides and Every season, hurricanes come and eat away at these islands even more. But then the, the sand goes around and builds up on the leeward side. So uh, that's just the active geo geology of these islands. But uh, on their exposed shore, they're often like this. There's very steep cliffs and then occasional bays. Uh, but you can imagine when you were coming in your sail ship from Europe or you were a native in a canoe like this, how hard it would be to find a good landing or a harborage on that exposed coast. Now, this is St. Lucia, where we're also going, which has the great piton, the great volcanic spikes that are the remnants of, of volcanoes, and they've been eroded down. This is on the uh, eastern shore, and in the, in the cusp of this northern side of it, there is still an active volcano and steam and mud baths that bubble up, and uh, you can actually drive in and see, see it active in that place. There and also on a few other islands, and then here in Dom Dominica, there are lakes that are crater lakes that get, l there's a lot of rainfall in the southern islands, and so they keep filling up with water, but they boil up. This is the great boiling lake in Dominica, which is, boils about 200 degrees Fahrenheit and steams off. Here's another volcanic uh, feature. This is in Virgin Gorda, Gorda, the British Virgin Islands. This is the Baths, if you've ever been there. This is a very dramatic beachfront, sort of like the Seychelles with all these great um, boulders that were deposited as uh, not flow, but actually ejected out of the violent volcanoes millions of years ago, leaving this kind of a scenery, which is quite charming on the beach, including you can go in where it's on the beach, the sand has come in, filled around the boulders, and you can go through caves and walkways on this uh, particular place. Here I am moving another pathway for people to get through, and uh, then getting down to what I consider the best beach in the entire Caribbean, in that it's a pool in the shade. And so you can go swimming in all these rocks and not have to get sunburned or uh, uh, chased by boats out there on the real surf. Another curious feature of an area of the Bahamas, this is Andros Island. That's the north coast of Cuba right there. This is called the Tongue of the Sea, the Tongue of the Ocean, which in the shallow continental shelf that the Bahama Islands are built up on by mostly coral and sand aggregation, there's a very deep, about 1,200 meter deep hole in the middle of this part of the sea. And I was down there again with uh, my sea kayak and my wife, and we went sailing down, landing on Andros Island, which is a very sh shallow island with very few inhabitants. And uh, we were stopped by a US Navy patrol because it turns out that this is where they do acoustic research for submarine warfare. And somehow we did not get clearance to go camping there. Here's another limestone and coral aggregate 
hole. This is the famous blue hole in Belize, which is a deep diving hole and now a natural preserve. And this example of how the, the, the reefs make their own ecosystem and build out almost refuges for the, all the sea life in those more tranquil parts. That's down on the Belize coast just south of here. But the currents that come across, driven by the trade winds, push currents into the Gulf of Mexico and then make these eddies and loops that spin around and then the accumulated hydrostatic pressure pushes the Florida current north of Cuba and then around through the Straits of Florida. And because of this pinching of the land and the pressure from the Caribbean basin into the Gulf of Mexico, it generates the great um, Gulf Stream, which has been called the largest river in the world and that it flows many, many times larger than all of the rivers of the world combined. Some right past uh, Miami in its depth, it flows some 400,000 swimming pools a second. And that, with the other current, the Antilles coming on the north side of the Bahamas, pushes all this water that is sort of pressed out of the Caribbean base and the Gulf of Mexico out into the Atlantic, making that great warm water stream that then flows into the North Atlantic and keeps the northern shores warmer than they would otherwise be, especially the British Isles, Scandinavia, and of course the Canadian islands and, and landmass there. But this great looping warm water is very important for the climate of the northern hemisphere, and especially for the European side. And uh, this has been monitored in very closely in recent years because it is always a variation of the storms and the water temperature, and if this great Gulf Stream somehow diminishes, that will leave northern Europe as a lot colder than it has been used to in recent uh, uh, decades and centuries. So this is a very important feature that is generated right out of the Caribbean. Now I'll talk a little bit about another curious phenomena of the area. It's not actually in the basin where we are, but uh, this is the Bermuda Triangle, which was legendary for airplanes and ships disappearing in it. And so this is the stuff of a lot of uh, curious uh, interest that mariners go down there, they find they get a lot of uh, magnetic variation in their compasses, and then there's also sea fogs and things, and then vessels disappear. Now this is uh, supposedly a true, true compass uh, spinning over some phenomena, and it may have been one of these squiddies coming by. We don't know, because uh, this one, we don't know how where it made it, and of course, Oh, well, that's, that's that carnival ship. I think that's the... You're lucky you didn't b book on that ship. And, of course, uh, this is the stuff of uh, much conjecture, why some vessels would disappear down there. And, and the, the thought now is that, that that shelf outside, north, south of Bermuda, north of the Bahamas, is like the Gulf of Mexico. It has a lot of natural gas and oil deposits there, perhaps. Uh, and that will come up and bubble out of the sea and create natural gas effusions and the nature of the bubbles is they aggregate as they go to the surface. So if you are, happen to be going along and come to where one of these bubbles breaks on the surface of the sea, it can actually become a hole and you will drop right into it, the sea will close and that'll be it for you. And, and, and similarly, if that gas goes up as invisible into the air and an airplane happens to hit it at the misfortunate time, it'll lose its lift and drop like a stone if it can't recover. And so this is the, the, the theory as to why certain vessels disappear, even though I still think it's the aliens trying to steal my yacht. Well, anyway, this is uh, well documented, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, where there's so much oil and gas development. And they have found great natural gas seepages and also crude oil coming out of the base of the, of the seabed. Uh, but it's sometimes so deep that Here's a case of frozen, compressed methane, natural gas, on the floor of the ocean. Because of the cold and the pressure down three, 4,000 feet deep, it actually comes up and it freezes. Um, and then it, it becomes a chunk that can actually be brought up to the surface and lit like a candle. Now, this is uh, the natural phenomena in the area, of course, oil and gas exploration has been poking around and finding maybe a little too much of it. But they have seen, the, the, the marine biologists, that around these very deep and dark and sometimes anaerobic, no oxygen seabed, around these gas releases, there's certain forms of life that fix 
uh, sulfur and create a food chain of uh, bacteria, then worms and small crabs and fish live on it. So here's some of the creatures that live in these otherwise inhospitable places. You see there's a little shrimp that's under the methane ice, it's called. And so this is a comparable to what they may find on other planets of life forms that live without either light or oxygen. And of course they've also found this uh, in the great volcanic fumaroles in the mid-Atlantic ridge and other parts of the oceans. On the Caribbean side though, there are, uh, because of the nature of tropical water, it's warm and saltier and sometimes the salt will sink and then concentrate in what they call brine pools on the bottom of the ocean, which then are very dense and almost soupy, salty water, different from the circulating seawater. And on here, again, they found that there are life forms that live deep in the dark bottom of the ocean on salt and this unusual, what would normally be poisonous water. So there are mussels and then fish and other things that will build, develop a food chain again in, in a way that is not possible on the surface, what we are more familiar with, with life forms. Then there's even a cu more curious thing they found in the Caribbean basin, which they named, I don't know who they named it after, the amoeba grumia. And that's a, ba uh, sorry, a golf ball size large amoeba that slimes its way around on the ocean floor and then will split like an amoeba and make more of itself. That's not on the menu in the restaurant, I assure you. But most of the life in the ocean, of course, is made by these uh, photoplankton, zooplankton. There are millions of varieties, almost like snowflakes. Everyone looks a little different. And this is supposedly perhaps up to one half of the biomass on Earth is made of these microscopic creatures in the ocean, which then feed on each other. Some of them are sort of half plant, half animal. They'll fix chloroform and sunlight and grow, but then they also have the ability to swim. Here's one that has these little filigree called chili that will make it swim along and feed on smaller organisms and, and commute up and down depending on the light cycle. They'll travel very far for their size, and then they're fed on by you know, all the more stranger and more voracious larger creatures in the and what is a highly complex life structures that uh, we're only just beginning to realize the variety of them, how unusual they are. And one of the remarkable explorations, of course, in modern science is down to the depths of the ocean and seeing things that we couldn't imagine before. So here, for instance, are little flagellant zooplankton, which have these little like ribbon-like uh, tails on them, and that allows them to swim, just spinning that thing around. And then they're fed by crustaceans of all kinds, and then uh, jellies, and up to things that we are more familiar with, including ourselves. And a lot of the life is mostly concentrated in the shallows and, of course, around the reefs. That's 90% of the ocean's life is right in these kind of aggregates of life that are particularly sensitive to storms and to pollution. But then you get things like the, the parrotfish, and then this is a Caribbean spiny lobster, which you'll get on a beach front barbecue or on board here. Uh, doesn't have claws. There are a lot of other endless variety of fish on these reefs. Here's a little puffer fish that flies with its wings. We saw this diving the other day off of uh, uh, St. Vincent. Then on shore you'll see very large stars like this. Now, they don't call them fish anymore because they are not a real fish. They are their own classification. And these, of course, feed on other shellfish and other small creatures. And they're used as bait for fishermen. Then there are all the jellies, which are many variety in many ways. And I've seen them up to about nine feet wide in certain parts of the ocean. And they have become a, a bit of a pest because as they, they thrive on uh, warmer waters, and now some of the tropical jellies are moving up the coasts into, uh, I was in Norway a few years ago, and they had tropical jellyfish in the height of the summer. Then they all die off. This is a favorite food of the sea turtles, though. Here's another fish from the Caribbean and that has moved north up into New England now. This is the lionfish, which has these spiny spikes that are very venomous, so you can't touch them without a great serious burn, but they are an aggressive fish that lead up all the other reef fish. Now they're preying on the, the northern species. Then you get a lot of game fish and larger game out here on the islands. Uh, this is a jackfish. Uh, there's a, I've been going around to the fishing markets and asking how is, how is it going and they, they say well it depends on the weather and the season but what they don't seem to have is any large schools of anything that 
attracts the international trawlers, fortunately, or else they're all gone. I'm not quite sure. But they ne these tropical seas never had those sort of vast schools of herring and cod and halibut and other things that would be taken in northern waters, which are more, more rich in zooplankton and uh, food for them. But there's still these billfish and some game fish. And here's one I saw just the other day in Granada. It's called a needle tooth fish, which is not doesn't look very appetizing. And uh, that that's the t the teeth are so sharp that I cut myself. I still have a little bite from this thing, and I, I'm just glad I'm not a little fish in, in that mouth. So they're catching all kinds of things. A lot of them just endemic. Uh, here's some uh, conch, the great shellfish, which is the staple food of some of the islands that still have enough of them. But they've been so picked out because they are easy to grab in shallows that now they're protected in various places just so they'll reseed and continue to grow. They're trying to actually create conch farms in certain islands, especially in the Bahamas, so that they have a, enough of it to go around. But a lot of these things uh, have been picked out and now endangered. Here's a kind of speckled octopus, which is endemic to the reefs. And as it grows, it gets red. And of course, these are very uh, intelligent and uh, capable little creatures that are ruthlessly hunted for uh, food. The, the turtles used to be very extensive through the Caribbean, such that they'd be picked off in the sea or on the beaches as they laid eggs and just thrown on the sailing ships as ready food, because they'd sit there and uh, put them in a tank of water. They'd live for weeks. Uh, there are two kinds, the um, hawksbill and the loggerhead. And these have been endangered by hunting, mainly, and to the point where they were, their eggs would be routinely dug up for food. Now, the, the hawksbill, though, is, uh, does, has a life out at sea and hunts, um, eats jellyfish and small game and things and lives out in the open ocean, will travel thousands of miles in its years, and then will come back after 10 years if it survives, and the females will lay eggs on the beach that they were born. And again, like a salmon and such, they can somehow figure out where they're going right to the spot where they were born as a little fry. And the female will lay... Uh, groups of about a hundred eggs at a time and then bury them from the birds and uh, Curiously, it's the only uh, reptile that cries while laying eggs as if I guess it's not that uh, uh, Not for the nostalgia of the little fry that the mother will never know, but maybe just because it's a uh, uh, rem Remembrance of its own desperate birth because once the nest is made and the eggs are under the sand the the top ones with the most sun heat become female, and the males are the ones at the bottom of the heap. But as on a, on a moonlit night, almost by some sort of a clue, they all hatch and they crawl out and they run into the ocean. And I was with a gentleman who's in, in Antigua and part of a turtle restoration. He said um, they went to test an area and they... Uh, the, they uh, shone a flashlight around, and they the turtles thought that was the moon, and they all hatched all of a sudden. And then they walked out back into the ocean with a flashlight, and all the hundreds of little turtles followed the flashlight into the sea. So it's not, I, I guess it isn't too hard to fool a turtle, but usually about one out of a thousand survive the birds, the larger fish that are preying on it. So it's a great snack, those little turtle hors d'oeuvres. Again, it's not served on this ship, I assure you. And so their range was all through these islands where we were, the loggerheads, the hawkbills, and then there's another creature which we won't see, which is the Caribbean monk seal, which is now officially extinct. The last one was sighted in 1952 in Honduras, living in the mangroves, but a recent survey of all of the islands could not find any evidence of this small seal, sort of very, not much fur on it because it's a tropical um, seal, but it's the first seal pinniped that's gone officially extinct. This is the sea cow or the manatee, and this is not extinct. It is endangered in some places because it is a big vegetarian, um, slow-moving mammal that comes up for air and lives in the mangroves and the grasslands and the shallows. And its greatest enemy, though, is the propellers of boats that tend to run into it. And I was just in Florida, and we saw a lot of them in the in the canals in around Fort Lauderdale, and one of the uh, skippers of the boat said, oh, they've, they've finally learned to get out of our way. Well, hopefully. But a lot of the older ones are all scarred up, and if they get injured bad enough, that's the end of them. They range all the way up from 
North American, uh, you know, mid mid Atlantic board all the way down to the Amazon, down to Brazil, and so some places there are many, but again, especially in the South American coast, they're they're still hunted for food. Uh, so this area where we are, the shallows, as, as illustrated here, all this green hatching from Florida to the Bahamas and around the islands, especially the south coast of Cuba, are considered the most fecund parts of the shores for all of these animals. Out on the bigger ocean, though, there are whales that migrate up and down this coast. Uh, this is the great humpback whale that goes from calving off the coast of South America and also the Dominican Republic, and then it goes up to New England, and then all the way up to Greenland to feed in the summer. And so these are the biggest of the, thing, of the whales you'll see here. There's uh, not that many where we are going right now. They're, they're, um, they're mostly further south calving, and they will... The, the mothers will feed in the north, and they will not eat for months while they have their uh, their baby whale. And then they have these um, sort of big bumps on their snout, which are sensors. And then they develop uh, crustaceans on them. Uh, they have uh, very long flippers and are very expressive in the water and jump and communicate. And of course, they sing. If you've heard the song of the humpback whale, they get the name because they, they when they do breach, they curl their back up very high, and you'll see the sort of stubby fin. And then their fluke will come up, and you'll be able to identify them. They can measure who they are or keep track of them. But these are uh, not carnivorous. They are not a toothed whale like the sperm whale or the orca. They have these cartilaginous baleen that uh, they'll swallow a great mass of plankton and small fish, and then they'll spit out the water. Here... Um, they're doing what's called bubble fishing. You may have seen films of this, where they'll, in a group, they will surround a school of fish and put out a net of bubbles and then come up and gobble them all up. They also have this great striated belly and throat that then will expand with the water they've taken in and then uh, filter out all of the food, which they can eat up to about a ton a day, depending on where they are. Again, the tropical waters are not as rich for them, but they come down here to play, mate, and then calve and have their young in the Caribbean waters. Especially there's an area called the uh, Samana in the Dominican Republic where there's a great calm bay. And I was there a couple of weeks ago. It was full of these whales and their pups. We saw, I would say, 20 of them in one short time right in that bay. A lot of these islands, though, have... Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of the weather and the land problems of them. This is the mangrove. We'll see this on some islands. Very important to the protection of the islands from storms. They've been much abused by development on the shores and uh, cutting them for firewood and such. But it's a very unusual plant. It grows in the salt water. It has roots in the sea. And the plant in the roots and also in its leaves will excrete salt. It's about 90% of the salt is taken out by the system they have there. And that's actually being studied as a, 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 an alternate way for desalination of seawater. Uh, but a lot of the animals live in the mangrove. Um, here's a, a, a little uh, green iguana, a baby iguana. And you'll see little brown li lizards and noles. And these are, oh, they're scurrying around. But they, they have the unusual ability of um, knowing when there's going to be a storm. And it's said that these... Um, uh, uh, iguanas and anoles know when there's going to be uh, heavy weather, and it's, of course, seasonal in the uh, June to November, but they will lay eggs when a storm approaches, and then some of these islands get washed over by the storm, and all of the adults die, but they all leave these little hard eggs that can float, and then they are stuck in the mangrove or, or ever on shore, and then a whole new generation pops up. So this is an example of the, the Caribbean animals that have uh, adapted to the very rough conditions that the weather brings. So I've, I've been taking a few pictures of birds. Here's a little red-throated wren, uh, a kind of a shimmering pigeon. You'll see a lot of these on the, on the islands. Here's a, a yellow-bellied, uh, I'm not sure the name of it. I, haven't, I saw this the other day. I don't even know what it is yet, so I have to find the right book. Um, here's a, f a fruit eater they call this one, a yellow-dyed fruit eater, the, the local told me. Here's an elfin warbler, which is a, a jungle bird in some of the islands. Here's a Puerto Rican hawk, which, which lives in the rainforest. And this is a, a loro, or a, or a green parrot that has been endangered 
hunted for its feathers and also as a, as a, as a pet bird down to where a few years ago, there were only three pairs left after a hurricane and they had to captive breed and try to reestablish that population. Uh, here's a white egret. There's a lot of these around. You'll see them, great flocks of them. And then pelicans. This is uh, the brown pelican, which you'll see flying around and fishing, and uh, they're pretty dramatic and kind of scary. And I came across uh, the uh, pelican's uh, favorite ditty, which is, A wonderful bird is the pelican whose bill can hold more than his belly can. He can put in his beak food enough for a week, but I'm darned if I can see how the hell I can. Very good. Now remember that one. There you go. Another thing you'll see are the frigate birds, and I've been trying to get a picture of one, but they're often so high in the sky that then so fast it's hard. You'll see they have a split tail, and they're very broad wing, maybe three to four feet wide. And occasionally they'll come swooping down, but um, they they nest on outside islands, and they're a true seabird. But their most distinctive is when they're mating season on the islands. They the males will puff up like this to uh, announce their intentions. Again, that's not allowed on board the ship. There are other islands where they've restored uh, flamencos and scarlet ibis, which were endangered again because they were hunted for feathers. And so these have now preserves, especially there's an island uh, uh, of um, Anandaga and Barbuda, have made island preserves for these birds and try to restock their population. And they are an indigenous uh, variety. They get their pinkness from eating shrimp and crabs. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of the forest. This is Puerto Rico, which is... Of course, San Juan, the big city on the north, uh, but there you see the green spot. That's El Yungi, the last of the real large rainforests that are left on in the islands with a lot of big bromeliad flowers, boa constrictors. Uh, and then this is the symbol of Puerto Rico, the coqui frog that has a distinctive singing sound in the forest. And so these jungles have been preserved somewhat from the intensive agriculture. There's a few reserves left around in some of the islands. We were just uh, the other day in Granada where they have a national park. And so they are full of life and are sort of these little spot biospheres that are very rich with this red-eyed frog. But agriculture plantations have cut much of the forest, but some of them remain and are um, actually being restored, to, particularly to hold more rain. A lot of the islands have become uh, deserts because of chopping of these forests. Some of them, this is in um, uh, Granada again, one of the seven... Sisters Falls, where there's a whole series coming down the mountains into the National Park. We, we hiked up there the other day, and the, in the rain, as someone said, don't forget to take an umbrella to a rainforest. Went for a swim. Uh, but the Caribbean islands, because of the hurricanes, have an unusual uh, root systems that have developed where there's a kind of a tree, this is one of them called the tabunaco, where the roots grow out, and then they go over and around and inside the other neighboring trees, such that when a hurricane comes and blows all the leaves off and breaks all the branches, the trunks sort of hold each other together and then the forest survives on that. And so this is an unusual development in the Caribbean that these trees actually help each other in the midst of these terrible storms. This is a mahogany tree, oops, another way, and um, most of this has been cut. And there's a variety of these big trees of, uh, there's a strangler fig which drops, its uh, seeds get laid in the branches of other trees, and it comes down and it strangles its host tree like this. This is the strangler fig. So this is a typical jungle. It's sort of a highly competitive and uh, uh, you know, the green hell of the uh, tropics, but uh, gets very, very dense, so in, uh, you can't even walk through much of this. Most of it was chopped, but here's an unusual tree. It's endemic to the Caribbean, the silk cotton tree, which was uh, a kind of, again, a jungle tree that is very soft. In, uh, in French, they call it the, the uh, arbol fromage because the wood is so soft it was like a cheese. But again, it has these great branching roots. And then it has the unusual quality when it's younger that it has spikes on it to keep animals and maybe humans away. But if you, if you strip the bark off and you boil it, it turns into cloth. So it was used by the slaves to make their own clothes so they didn't have to buy any. And it was worshipped as a, a gift from the jungle. Now, more typically, you'll see bananas and papayas, breadfruit, all these planted, cultivated trees around the houses. Um, but here's some termites getting into the, the grove there. Then you'll see the, um, what they call the flame of the jungle or the flamboyant in French, the uh, great red flower trees with big nuts. 
Uh, on some of the drier islands of the Bahamas, you get uh, the barrel cactus with this distinctive red crown on it. It's a symbol of Turk and Caicos. But all of these um, flora and fauna are very much at risk to the great demon of the Caribbean, which is, of course, the great hurricane. Hurricane the, being the Caribbean native word for the goddess of the wind. And these are endemic. Oh, it's just like a cyclone or a typhoon anywhere in the tropics. But in the um, Caribbean, they are generated by sandstorms off of Africa that then develop um, low pressures that then soak up the heat of the tropical Atlantic, come across into the Caribbean. They start to spin an eye. The uh, hot air comes up off of the hot ocean, and then a downdraft starts, and it begins to rotate in a counterclockwise way. And then it generates into the monsters that we're all familiar with. Now, this is a regular phenomena. Every summer it begins, and they come across, and you can watch them on TV now. Uh, but if you're on the wrong side of it, depending on your island or your vessel, you're either doomed or you can get away from it. So the standard sailing instruction was always put that kind of a low pressure on your starboard quarter and you would sail away from the storm. If you went any other way, you'd get caught up on it and you might not survive. The problem with the Caribbean and then the whole North American coast is that whenever a storm comes, there's land in the way, especially these islands and the lucky ones uh, spin off into the central Atlantic. You see the ones off of the Pacific coast, they usually go off into the, the Pacific. But right where we are is what they call the convergence-divergence zone. If the storm is a little north of the islands where we are, it will typically go off into the um, North Atlantic and not cause so much trouble. But if it slips south of Puerto Rico and ends up in the Caribbean basin, then it can go into the Central American coast or go up in the Gulf of Mexico. And especially if it gets to that warm water in the Gulf of Mexico, it becomes a big monster, as we saw with Katrina. And the storms have been getting bigger and bigger over the recent years. Now, the track of the record, there's always every about 20 years a major storm comes through on every piece of the Caribbean. So it's sort of like Russian roulette in the, in the sea here. And then if they get into the Gulf of Mexico, they can do all the damage on the continental coast. But here's the, the remains of St. George, Granada. The, we were there the other day, and there were 90% of the roofs taken off that town by Hurricane Ivan in 2003, and now they're still repairing it. But there are ruins all over town, including the cathedral. And of course, a lot of damage to the land. They ruin the agriculture and the coral reefs. And so this is the beating that the Caribbean, unfortunately, gets all the time. Parts of the Pacific, uh, China coast, Japan, and India also get it. But the Caribbean gets the most, probably. Everywhere you'll go, you'll see evidence, like the sunken ship. This is in St. Martin, Marigo Bay. But even in the average tropical storm can do a lot of damage. Here's a great uh, uh, water spout, it's called, a tornado at sea. And that led to this famous painting by Win Winsler Homer of the, the, the sailor who didn't get back in time. The humans have uh, been in this area for maybe 10 to 15,000 years. I'm going to finish just with a, just talking about the impact of humanity. This is an early Taino ceremonial circus, circle in Puerto Rico, sort of like a little Stonehenge. But originally, there were maybe 10 to 20,000 Caribe, Lucayan, Arawak natives that were on these islands. Originally, they probably came from either the north or the south continents. But then they had villages like this, which is reconstructed in Puerto Rico, Taino village. And then when Columbus and all the Europeans came, the troubles really began when they were put to work, enslaved if they didn't convert. and. A lot of them resisted the Spanish, especially, and then uh, they caught smallpox and other influenzas and mostly died out. That's when the plantation culture started and all the African slaves were brought over, and the Africans were stronger and healthier in the tropical climate, but again were put to uh, the labor of particularly sugarcane when that became the world's most valuable crop. I'll talk about this uh, sometimes not very happy history later uh, another day, but uh, you'll see the remains of the plantations all through these islands, the great windmills and sugar mills that would grind up the uh, cane and make the sugar. Uh, now only a little bit's grown for molasses for rum. But the major impact of all this change in the islands was deforestation, so there's often just a remnant of a forest left, and they're still clearing secondary growth and still making pastures. And you see, some of the sugarcane fields are overgrown and now not active anymore because the sugar business uh, was taken away by beet and other sweeteners over the time. But you'll see a lot of land that's now pasture, or now it's urbanized. Uh, 
I think that's a cow that got loose. There's actually wild cattle in some of these islands. Then banana plantations came in, and that's a major business in the islands, even though it is a very easily destroyed crop, crop by um, hurricanes. And then, of course, tourism has come in, and that's been the saving economy for many of these islands because the commodity agriculture has been very uh, poor, and a lot of the people have been desperately poor. But now with the... Uh, to international travel and development, a lot of these islands have become, I would say, somewhat prosperous, like Barbados is probably the most prosperous, along with the British Virgin Islands and Antigua, because of the international travel. Here's St. Bart's. And so this has led to other problems where you have very poor people and then all these wealthier visitors that overwhelm the towns. This is St. John's Antigua, and you'll see plenty of this. Uh, these uh, monoliths from outer space that come in. But that's meant that th this development has given a whole new era for the people and then the wildlife and ecology of the Caribbean. This is actually the coast of Colombia, so w we're only seeing a little bit of it. There's a lot all, of course, all the way around the basin. But the human impact has been very bad in many places with either agricultural pollution, industrial runoff, and other spot pollution, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, because it doesn't get quite the flow of uh, water through it. It all stays in the basin uh, quite a bit. And the oil production in the Gulf of Mexico has meant lots of the coast and lots of the subsea are now have pollution. Of course, we've heard a lot about the BP spill. That's just one of many, if oh, the, perhaps the worst. Then this great river system, the Mississippi, puts out an incredible amount of pollution into the Gulf of Mexico. Here's sediment coming out off the delta. And this is natural runoff, pretty much, but it has a lot of pesticides and chemicals and all sorts of things in that that has made parts of that shore, like the sh parts of the South American coast, now dead seas for the natural wildlife. This is the dead zone, they call it, of the anaerobic water around the mouth of the Mississippi. And then the oil industry is our great conundrum of our age with production all through these areas, especially Trinidad, Venezuela, and then Mexico around the U.S. coast with all the kind of pollution that we're familiar with. This is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela, which is now a dead piece of water because of constant oil sheen over it and no sea life and lake life in that major production area anymore. So some of these problems may be solved eventually. Here's a proposal to have a, uh, a green and self-sustaining resort built out on the water and not on the shore, such that it would recycle all of its waste and products and then not have the impact of shore development. But even on the shore, there's proposals to have tidal and wind energy to supply the growing population and uh, have less impact on the, the, all the shore and the islands. But there are a lot of little islands and a lot of beautiful places. And here's in uh, Turk and Caicos and the Bahamas especially have whole sprays of islands that are uninhabited. Uh, but the other major problem these days is the die off of the coral. And about half of the Caribbean coral has been impacted and is in bad shape. And if you're going to go snorkeling or diving anywhere, you'll see a lot of it is either damaged by storms or pollution or places. And some of the islands, they go out and dredge up the reef to make aggregate to build railroad, I mean, uh, roads and development. And that's pretty much known as a bad thing to do for many reasons. Here's a brain coral that's losing its memory. But the coral's a very tenacious little polyp. And it, it, if, it give, if it's given its chance, it will grow back. And so in some places, like here off of Antigua, they've been restoring the reef by building an artificial blocks that are put in and then are planted with plants and then suddenly all the life comes back and the coral starts to revive. And so I've been diving around here for quite a while and I go back to places and it was damaged or just impacted once and now suddenly it's back and flourishing. But the real problem is the heat of the water and the, uh, they call the acidification of the ocean, which is a global problem. But nonetheless, you'll see a lot of places are doing okay and hopefully they'll do better, especially as more environmental knowledge is known. So a lot of these beautiful islands uh, are natural preserves that leave an opportunity for the um, Caribbean to revive itself. And um, it, humans have done a lot of damage, but then again, they may repair it. And uh, so I'm going to leave you the last words of a certain uh, Captain Thomas Gage, who wrote the new survey of the West Indies in 1648. And he said, those who have described these parts before of trade and winds, currents, and hurricanes do tell, of headlands 
harbors, the tread ends of shore, of rocky islets wherein they might as well talk of a nut and only show the shell, the kernel never tasted, touched, nor seen. But while we get to travel here ourselves and feel the sand and the wind and the sea, I hope you can appreciate how beautiful this part of the world is. Thank you very much and look forward to our cruise together. Thank you. <laughs>